Welcome everybody. Uh, hi everyone. Welcome to another session at YMC Con. So my name is Purna. Uh, I'm one of the organizer of YMC Con. And today we have a Q&A session with Thomas. Uh, so uh, Thomas has already shared his uh, pre-recorded talk. So if you missed this talk, don't worry. It's already available on our YouTube uh, channel and also posted to this course. And today's session is all about uh, discussing with uh, Thomas, uh, engaging him and asking all your doubts uh, or any anything related to the topic. So uh, yeah, I'm setting the uh, discourse link uh, in the chat section where you can post all your doubt uh, or anything related to the topic if you want to discuss. And uh, Thomas will be answering all of them one by one. So what do you, Thomas? Uh, uh, could you give a little intro of, the, of your talk so that uh, Sure. Um, well, thank you so much, Purna, for the introduction. Thanks, everyone, for joining. I'm very excited to spend the next hour chatting about space and causal inference or whatever other questions you have. If you have just questions on general things in life, uh, it's all fair game. Um, so I am one of the authors of PyMC. I started in grad school, and it's been it's been a it's been a fun journey. Uh, Back then, the project was called PyMC3, and it was just um, very experimental code that was out there. Uh, but it sort of grew over time uh, with coming with more and more contributors coming on and more and more users. And I really never could have imagined how big and successful the project would become. I mean, I definitely had seen the potential very early on. Um, so John Salvatier was really the person who, like, had the vision of using Theano for this, which was like completely novel at that time. And I was like, that's just the coolest idea I've ever seen. Um, so I wanted to get involved. And then basically from there, uh, it grew. And now we've been, I guess, pushing this through PyMC4 and PyMC5 and backend changes and all of that, where now I'm happier than ever with like the state of the project in all regards, in terms of the, the code, the contributors, the users, the community, just uh, it all just seems to be coming together. And also like all these backend things, which have definitely been stressful and, um, and challenging, but I th we've overcome them. And I don't see any like sort of icebergs ahead for us. So then I guess a couple of years ago, there was more and more talk about causal inference. And even though I had known a lot about Bayesian modeling, I didn't even really know uh, too much what that causal inference was. And it seemed very confusing to me because they were using their own language and there were all these overlaps that seemed kind of obvious, but they were just talking about it in different ways. And everyone I would ask of like, well, like for example, right? They would show these uh, structural causal models, these diagrams, right? The uh, sprinkler makes the grass wet and that makes it slippery. I'm like, okay, I mean, that makes sense, but you can just do that in PyMC as well. But no one really was able to explain to me clearly like, well, this is the relationship between causal modeling and Bayesian modeling. And it took, well, I guess mainly Ben Vincent to like really go through a lot of the causal inference of literature, which originated from like a totally different set of um, I guess academic uh, field, then uh, Bayesian inference came. So it makes sense that they're like have overlaps, but don't really quite know exactly how they relate to each other. And, but uh, so it was like mainly Ben Vincent then who really like um, went through and figured out the connections and they are well, simultaneously very deep and simultaneously um, they are completely different things. So maybe just to refresh everyone's memory, I'm going to um, show some of the key slides, at least the way that I see them. Um, I have a screen share here. So... That really these two things are orthogonal, right? So you have uncertainty quantification and I guess actionability or the causal ladder you could put here. 
we have uncertainty quantification, right? If we have point estimates, we don't have any whatsoever. Uh, there's a way to do uncertainty with a frequentist framework. I'm happy to argue with anyone um, that I think the Bayesian framework is better at uncertainty quantification for a few reasons, and actually a few reasons that actually matter in causal inference. Oops. Ah, Purna, um, I think you somehow... Yeah, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, uh, one, one. Um, anyway, yeah, so... I guess, uh, yeah, uh, you can see it now. Cool, cool. And um, all the way to Bayesian modeling. And then on the other hand, we have something like black box machine learning, where we don't really learn anything uh, about the problem, right? The classifier is learning something to make better predictions, but it's not really um, helping us understand and gain insight and thus really act um, in the world and know what, out what actions lead to which outcomes. And then there are statistical correlations a lot of Bayesian modeling that you might see, like linear regressions, are of that flavor. And then I would say highest on that ladder is the causal DAG and interventions and these type of things. So from that perspective, it's clear, right, that Bayesian modeling and uh, causal inference are orthogonal to each other. You can just do causal inference with point estimates. You can do causal inference in a frequency framework or in a Bayesian framework. And I guess one of the, well, and maybe let's just go through this completely. Um, Scikit-learn, right, is point estimates and mostly black box machine algorithms. There is a way to get um, uncertainty based on uncertainty for most black box machine algorithms. That's a new field called conformal prediction, which I think is kind of cool. And, um, but you don't really build these causal decks, right? It's still black box ML. Death models is very much frequentist for the most part. Do why? Um, is causal, um, but still doesn't really do uh, Bayesian uncertainty. And with adding the new do operator, well, that's where we now added more of that ability. But actually, it turns out you could have done, you can do, well, you could have done Bayesian causal inference already before, because that graph that you're building is, can be, causal in nature, right? So you can build a DAG that maps your data generation process and then really use that to reason about the world, right? And make inferences. And if that interpretation is causal and is like valid of the causal graph, then those inferences will be, tell you something about the causal structure. Now you can't do interventions at that point, but with a new do operator, you can. So that is really what that um, what I guess inspired this talk in many ways is like, well, now we are able to like officially say, well, you can do like proper causal stuff in Pi and Z, even though you could have done before, but like with the do operator, it's, I guess, a little bit more obvious. Um, so yeah, you do inference, and this is basically the part even without the do operator. And there is a causal interpretation of this because the graph that we've built here is has a causal interpretation. So the weights that we're interpreting strength of the connections are causal. And then this is basically telling us something about that strength. And then we can climb that causal ladder and add more uh, by adding interventions. And, and that's what that two operator is doing. So, um, so that, I guess, is like how I now started to think about these two things. And, and I think actually that causal inference brings a lot to the table for Bayesian modeling and vice versa. So I think those two things really work extremely well together. Why? Um, well, causal inference, I think, does suffer from not, well, I mean, it's a bit unfair, right? If we're calling this um, orthogonal, that actually like causal inference shouldn't really necessarily concern itself with uncertainty quantification, right? So that's fair, but certainly that's important, right? So if you do causal inference without any uncertainty quantification, it's not gonna be, uh, you're gonna be fooled by randomness, right? As our friend Nate Silver aptly put it. And
And I think as Bayesians, we can actually gain a lot from adopting more causal language and tools. And that point actually is a little bit more subtle, I think. And one of the key points that I've been personally struggling with um, in explaining the upside of Bayesian modeling is that, I mean, so why even, even do this, right? And when you talk about Bayesian statistics, well, what is that characterized by? It's characterized by, of course, uncertainty quantifications, placing priors, and, and all these good things. But I don't think that that's actually the main thing. The main thing is not in the Bayesian part, but in the modeling part. Most people don't really do statistical modeling, right? It, no matter what uncertainty quantification framework they're using. So the alternative often is either you do machine learning or you do frequentist linear regressions or you do Bayesian modeling. So that there's a lot of like things conflated here because what I think is really, really powerful is to do statistical modeling. And one way to do statistical modeling is Bayesian modeling. And I think that's the best way to do it, but there are other ways. And I think that that modeling part is the most powerful and not necessarily the Bayesian. Like, yes, Bayesian is cool and has all these nice properties, but the powerfulness comes from the fact that we're really diving in. We're understanding the problem we're building, we're we're trying to understand the data generation process and we're mapping that into like a complex model structure that really sort of maps that project into the statistical structure. And then we estimate the parameters out of it. Like that process is I think 80% of the power that comes from this. And then, well, cool, now we also get uncertainty. So, so that I, and, and that logic, right? That like, well, we really need to think about the causal structure of the problem, that modeling aspect is, prime and center for causal modeling because they don't even think about uncertainty quantification for the most part, right? They think about the cost structure. So by putting that first, I think it's much more helpful to explain to people that this is cool and what the upsides are because now we talk about actually the modeling aspect, right? And the fact that we're building the structural causal graph and it's just so intuitive also, right? Like if we explain to someone what uncertainty is and, and things like that, then um, I, in my personal experience, that's not as exciting to them. But if you tell them, well, actually, in order to make better decisions, right, in order to, this is what I meant by this, what's the purpose of data science? If you tell someone, well, you, in order to make better decisions, you really need to understand how actions lead to outcomes. That is just like intuitive clear to most people. So. That's why I am quite excited about this, um, even though it's actually not that different from the type of Bayesian modeling that we've already been doing before. Um, but now we have, I guess, better language, better frameworks for it. And, and that is like a big, big motivator. Um, cool. So we have a question now. Uh, so does the do operator in Pi MC work in time series? Yep. Uh, if I intervene on a state at time t, does this propagate through the later states in the model? Okay, so that's a good question. And I don't directly know the answer, so I need to think about it a little bit. So let's think about what the do operator is doing. What the do operator is doing technically at the graph level is saying, okay, I have this graph, right? And now I want to intervene here and set this to specific, specific value. And this is actually quite challenging. I'm taking a little detour and talk about the technological aspect because if, for example, you don't have an actual representation of that graph, right? Of, at the, we call this often the sampling graph because the nodes in here are random variables and there's different ways of doing that. 
you, if different ways of re representing this graph, you can also represent this graph at the log p level, right? So where you just like basically build up the log p of this, and then um, and then you compute gradient, right? And that's actually what Stan is doing. So Stan never has that explicit representation of this graph. They just sum up the log p and just like have a one big log p expression, and then they do sampling on that. And that's the reason why in Stan you can't just like define a model and then say, give me posterior predictive diff samples from this, right? You need to write a separate graph, which then tell that to sample. In PyMC, we have it at the sample graph level, but we have this explicit representation, which allows us to do prior predictive, posterior predictive, do inference. And that's actually not that simple because no matter, on, depending on what we want to do, we have to derive certain other graphs. Like if we want to compute the log P, we have to take that graph and walk through it and then compute the log P from that. However, having this available at this level of representation is extremely powerful. Um, and it's actually been quite a bit of work, uh, mostly Ricardo Vieira who did that, to get to that level where we can now take this graph and really just like modify it. And another bit of history, that is one of the key reasons why um, some of you might remember this when Theano was discontinued. We at PyMC were like, well, damn, what are we going to do? Um, well, what's the next coolest framework? TensorFlow is like what everyone is using. And TensorFlow probability already gave us a lot of power. So for a while, we explored TensorFlow probability. And we didn't go with that because they really do not want you to interact with that computational graph at all. There's like many mechanisms in place that actually prevent you from doing that. They just really don't want you to because they say like, well, we have full control over that and we're going to do all kinds of crazy optimizations for that. Just like don't touch it. And Theano was like amazing because that really allowed you and had many great functionalities for changing that graph. And that um, needed to be supported better. And now we have like much better support for that in order to do these graph manipulations. So now going back to the do operator, that's exactly what we need to do, right? Because this graph here is a different graph than the one before. So we need to take this graph, we need to copy it and make changes. What are the changes we need to make? We need to sever this input connection, right? That season is not connected to this anymore. And we need to replace this node with actually constant value. So you could write this down in PyMC where you just say, okay, I have season as a random variable, I have rain as a random variable, wet as a random variable, slippery as a random variable, and sprinkler have as a pm.constant data, or just constant, with value one. That's the same thing as doing the do operator and setting this to a value. And, and that returns you a new graph, right? So if we look at the code here, we pass in a model we say which of those variables we want to replace with constants, and then we get a new model, right? So that's that function is doing exactly what I just described, popping the model, doing the graph manipulations, and then giving me this changed model back. So now if we do interventions on time series, it's the same thing, right? So we have a time series, and maybe there are certain values which we now replace with constant values, I guess, right? Um, so it's as if, so let's say we have a Gaussian random walk, right? So we have normal random variables every time. And then one of those normal distributions we will place with a constant value. Um, so it would break the dependent structure at that point, And then the next point will depend on the constant value of that before. So that should just work and actually then so like, let's say we have the intervention, right? And it's like a, just a meandering around zero. And then we set it at five, and then it should continue from there on out. So um, you should check whether that is true or whether I'm full of BS, um, but that's what I think would happen. Now, there is a, another thing you can do. Um, so it's not just pm.do that we have added, but there's also pm.observe. Right, because there's two things. You can replace a random variable with a constant, which is what the do operator is doing, or you can say, well, actually, 
I have observed that the sprinkler is on, right? And, and that is different, right? So here the sprinkler is on 100% or here it's just like, but I have an observation that tells me the sprinkler is on. And there might be noise around that observation, right? Like maybe I don't wear my glasses and um, it just is a bit foggy. So I think it's on, but actually it's not, right? So that is different. And if you call pm.observe in the very same way, right? Then it would say actually Z, I have observed to be off. So in that time series example, you could also do that. Um, so uh, if, you, if you, for example, have a latent process, then um, yes, you could, um, you could say that like on that latent process, you observed certain things. And that's actually really cool. Um, and something we did uh, at Primacy Labs for this um, HelloFresh media mix model project. So media mix models tell you how efficient are my marketing channels, right? So you spend, I don't know, 10 million on Google ads and you get a thousand users on that day. So you want to estimate how do my ad spend on these different marketing channels translate to the users I want to get. And that's like the most basic um, MMM. Now you can imagine that this efficiency of, or like this, yeah, efficiency of the Google Ads channel today does change over time, right? So one of the things we did, which I haven't seen that much being done in the literature, I mean, it, these time series models are hard, but like it makes a lot of sense and makes the model way better. So hopefully that's something we see more of. But anyway, so we, um, we did that. We built that model where each of those is a Gaussian process and the, ch um, the marketing channel effectiveness is allowed to vary over time using this Gaussian process, could be Gaussian random walk, whatever. And that is latent, right? It's a thing we don't observe. We only observe the spend and the users we signed on to our platform, the new customers. And we want to infer from that that latent time varying process. But we can observe it if we do certain experiments like lift tests, right? Lift tests are when you have certain population, like an AB test, certain population which saw um, the ad, for example, if you have Twitter ad or something, right? 50% on those people, like in on the East Coast, those people saw it, but on the West Coast, they didn't, right? And then you can see, okay, where did I get my clients from? And then you really like have a very good idea of um, what the effect of that ad was. That is expensive thing to do and a complicated thing to do, so you don't often do it. But when you do it, it actually gives you a lot of cool information about this. And you can add that as an observation into that latent process, right? So before we just like infer that from the data that is indirect and one step removed from the actual thing we want to observe, but there we actually observe the channel effectiveness with pretty high accuracy. And this is where you could use this observe thing where you say, well, actually now I have an observation of this latent process, pm.observe, and um, you input something. And you can actually also replace the zero with the new random variable. So you can also say, well, actually, um, yeah, I don't want to replace it with a zero, but let's say, so these are called stochastic interventions, um, but there's some noise around this um, for the scene. Cool. Um, yeah, pm.observe is, is quite powerful. And actually, so then just to um, take that even one step further, what this allows is for a new workflow uh, in PyMC, one that we're starting to use more and more, and which I think is actually the, the best way to build models. And that is Okay, what is the old way? The old way is you do with pm.model, you write your model at the very last line, you have observed, right? Observed equals the data. Cool. And then you call pm.sample, right? Nothing wrong with that. But that's usually not the, that, that's what a lot of people do and that's what I oftentimes do. But, um, ah, sorry, no. Um, let me just stop this for a second. Um, we can um, 
and a, oh, actually, there is um, some code on this I can show. I hope I can find it so on our GitHub. So unfortunately, he didn't continue this, um, but it is cool. Um, so part of the um, part of the Bayesian workflow is to run things like prior predictive checks, right? So in this new workflow, what you would do is actually you start out with a model that does not have any observed in it, right? So you might call this a skeleton model, just like this is defined the joint block probability graph, no observed, no nothing. You see there's no nothing here. So then we use that model skeleton to generate new data. And oftentimes now we might wanna use the do operator to set certain values here, right? So these are all priors, but let's just say, okay, we, I wanna simulate a data set where say, this value rather than sampling from the prior, I just want to set um, this to one, this to two, right? And fix certain values, and just see what that data set looks like. So you can do that. Here we set the true values. You can do that with the do operator. So the generative model or skeleton model and the true values. Now you can see we replaced these now with constant datas. And now we simulate data with prior predictive. And that's cool. Right now we have this simulation part of this where uh, with that, now let's say, okay, this looks kind of cool. The data we can generate is, um, makes sense for what we would expect. Now what we might want to do is we actually have observed data that we want to fit the model on. So now we still take that same generative model and we call observe and we pass in the data that we have actually observed for this. And now we get a new model derived from the skeleton original model with um, these things set to observed. And note that these are not replaced with constants, right? Because we went back to the skeleton original model. And then we call pm.sample, we do our inference. And um, well, then we can do the do operator to time travel and generate um, different things now on the model inference thing, right? So now we want to say, well, given the data we have observed, what would happen if I would if I did an intervention? And then we can just play with different counterfactuals. And say, so, okay, now we want to set B to zero, and now we want to set B to the data um, that we saw here. And then we can do posterior predictive sample and check different scenarios um, and the interventions, different counterfactual uh, scenarios. So that I think is super cool and and great. So uh, I think everyone should start adopting that workflow where you always just define lock pro the lock joint model and then you just derive whatever model you need for that particular context. And that's something which you can finally, finally do. Um, so then um, there's another question, how can you use causal inference on non-stationary data? Um, I mean, just like I explained, right? So it doesn't need to be linear. You can just intervene on, on whatever. There's really nothing stopping you from doing that. Um, yeah, Bruno, maybe you have a, um, a more specific question of why you think that wouldn't work. Um, uh, but yeah, so there's a lot of flexibility in that way of working. I guess there's another question from Jab. Um, in your example, if I recall correctly, you implement the do z operator with a binary variable. How does this change when z is a continuous variable? I believe this may be relevant to your HelloFresh example, but I'm not sure if I'm making the connection. Uh, yes, so it actually doesn't matter. Like there's really no difference to what you're intervening. So obviously if I'm intervening on a binary variable, then I would only set zero and one values, even though you actually don't technically have to. I mean, it would just, it's the only thing that's consistent within the model I've built. 
because we're replacing that node, right? So it actually doesn't matter what it was before. Like before, it might have been a Bernoulli, but now it's just a um, it's just a constant data. Um, so with that insight, right? Um, like the do operator becomes quite demystified, at least for me, right? You really just are replacing it with a with a constant, and and that's it. So if it's a linear model, well then it will influence that in whatever way um, it would if you would have a constant value in your graph. Um, if you have a, say, you have a linear regression, right? And you have the beta, the slope, and that's a normal prior or whatever prior, and then you do a do intervention on that and you call pm.do, my model skeleton, and then the dictionary that maps beta the slope to the value five, it'll just go in and replace that with five, and then then call pm dot prior predictive sample or posterior predictive sample, um, sample prior predictive sample posterior predictive. It will give me the the generated data with the beta set to five, and nothing but five, right? So it's just fixed. Um, so yeah, I guess uh, maybe as Bayesian, we're like so used to think about distributions everywhere that we have sometimes uh, lost the ability to think in point estimates, but that's basically what it is, right? So we just like set that to fixed scalar or whatever um, point value, um, and, and that's the only value it'll take. Um, Bruno, follow up, what I meant is how you can use causal inference when your data observations are not independent and the autocorrelation is changing with time. Um, I see, okay, so if you have a time series data. Um, so, right. Um, so I guess it's a little bit, uh, there's some nuance there, I guess, um, because you can't really, well, you can, but it doesn't really make sense to replace observed data with the do operator, right? Um, so we do interventions on unobserved latent causes. Um, actually, that's not true. Um, in the example I've given, we replaced observed with that. Um, So I guess, uh, I mean, I guess the question also is related to um, the time series, right, that you have. Um, and now you want to make interventions on that time series. So I guess at particular times. So that's an interesting case. I haven't, I mean, I guess I, like thought through this before, right? Where you do interventions on like individual time points. So I laid that logic out, but actually now that I think about it again, you're replacing that entire node, right? So you, you're not going in and just like changing an individual value of this like random variable, right? Where you just say, okay, well now um, that would be observed, right? So you can change the observed time series, but you can just only replace the entire node with a constant node. So if you have a time series node, right? And maybe that's a Gaussian random walk, which is observed, which is totally cool. And you call it pm.do, you could just only, and the do operator, you could only replace that with a constant value of probably that same length for it to make sense. Um, yes. Um, now, again, I think the, um, interesting cases if you do interventions on individual time points. So I would imagine that Ricardo and Ben know that answer. Um, I don't think they're here, um, but I don't. I, I will look that up um, because it's an interesting relevant question. And I think I've actually seen that before where like exactly that was done, but um, I don't recall where. Maybe Causal Pi is doing that. Um, 
but yeah, I mean, so that's like, I think a super interesting, powerful application of this. Um, but yeah, how that works in detail, I don't know. Let's, let's find out. Okay, Galen asks, what changes to Bayesian workflow should we consider making when we're also doing causal workflow? Wow, that is a really good question. Um, I don't know. I guess the, the answer to that question lies in the direction of what is the causal workflow, right? I mean, one thing that we probably need to be careful about and reason about is that we have the correct structural causal model. And I mean, we need to have the correct Bayesian model and Bayesian modeling anyway, right? So that whole model checking thing is a part of the Bayesian workflow already. Nonetheless, I would argue that if you really want to make strong causal claims, you need to be even more careful that those causal connections in your graph are actually indeed causal in the way you think they are. So I would say the model checking is a little bit more important. And so I would I would say that you probably should spend more time in the very beginning to think about different plausible graphs, different plausible causal graphs of how this thing could fit together, right? And maybe also be play more of a devil's advocate and really think about, okay, um, like I think that's causal, right? But what would someone critical actually think? Uh, what type of model would they um, draw? And then you test multiple models of that and then you see which one actually explains the data best and which one can I argue for. So that I think is um, always a good idea. And, and an even better idea. And so I hope that, I, and I would not um, be surprised if there was like a more richer answer. Um, and maybe other people actually have like that whole thing already figured out. I would also not be surprised if this is like something which is still a little bit um, up in the air and where we have to like talk about it, right? And be like, okay, well, what changes in this way? So I think you're kicking off a really interesting discussion here that is very relevant and where I don't claim to have all the answers um, and something, yeah, which we can think and talk about. So I would be curious to hear your thought on it. Um, if, uh, yeah, what do you think we need to, should change in this scenario? Um, I'm actually also curious to hear from anyone here, not just questions, but like their own experience or what they think about causal Bayesian inference, causal inference in general. Um, so yeah, I guess we have the chat open. So feel free to just um, um, talk about your own experience and then I will relay those. Um, so there's another question. Um, okay, but before that, I wanted to talk about um, something else. Um, well, actually, I'll go to the question and then come back to that. So, uh, Justin follows up on the time series. Justin follow up with the time series question. Do and observe could be considered the same if we have a made up time series that we treat as observed, correct? No. Um, so, that would be saying that I have a model written as PM dot constant with just like the time series that I observe and the time series like PM dot observe. So PM dot constant, right? Never ever has any incoming nodes, right? It's just the value it is and you can't change it no matter what the inputs are doing. PM dot observe, um, still retains the random variable, right? If that's a Gaussian random walk, it'll be a Gaussian random walk with 
conditioned on the data. Um, so that's the key difference. And then you sample, right? And then you infer the most likely parameter values, the posteriors for the for the random walk, for example, right? For the mean um, parameter. But in PM to constant, there won't be a mean um, because it's just constant. So that's a critical difference between the two. Um, and again, yeah, you can just go back to what that model would look like with a PM dot constant. I mean, PM dot constant is quite extreme, right? Because you're saying, well, yeah, there's nothing, nothing observed there. This is the value of this thing in the graph. Um, and it's not going to be really used for, um, for inference. Um, at least at that, that node will not have any influence um, because it, um, it isn't affected by any parameter changes, right? Because it's, it's constant. Um, right. Um, Justin says, so do breaks the graph and observe this not. Exactly right. Yes. PM dot do. Um, breaks the graph. Um, PM dot observe. Observe the graph and um, the input nodes to that node are uh, retained. That is right. Yeah. And I think if once you understood that, um, the the difference becomes a lot clearer. And actually, so this is, I guess, a meta point also that I found to be very true is for me, causal inference was pretty confusing. Um, and it still is to some extent, but actually once I was able to put it into a Bayesian context, a Bayesian framework, and re-express those ideas in this framework, everything made much more sense to me. Of course, I'm usually biased, right? Because I already have been thinking about Bayesian modeling for a very long time. And if you, talk, if you explain to me something in my language, of course, I'll explain it better, understand it better. But, um, uh, but I do think that a lot of those things that are not quite so, um, quite so clearly defined. I mean, the do operator is clearly defined, right? Uh, but more at the probabilistic level. So for me as a computer scientist at heart, um, it's much more, it's much easier to like explain to me, well, actually, yeah. Um, in PyMC, if you do pm.constant, let's do. And if you just like have an observed keyword argument that is pm.observe, like then I can really think about it and understand it. And if you then tell me, okay, well, um, we have a structural call graph and now we're just gonna build the PyMC model from that, well then, um, that's great, and um, and we can um, we can do that. Yeah. Okay. Ah, perfect. Gone. Um, comes back to that question about um, about the Bayesian workflow. Um, one thing that comes to mind is checking a model under different applications of the do operator. Just like in prior predictive checks to see if the distribution looks okay, you can do the same to see if the interventional distributions look like what you expect. I love that. Yes. Um, different interventions. Um, and and that actually, I think, extends even further. So um, last week, we at, uh, at Pimes Labs, we are at our annual Pimes Labs retreat in uh, beautiful, sunny Lisbon. So nine uh, folks from the IMC Labs crew um, gathered in this really cool villa and, and we had a great time and discussed, of course, many nerdy topics. Um, and one of them, uh, Christian Duman brought up is called um, uh, Robust Bayesian. And I actually wasn't that familiar with that, but it makes a lot of sense. What we often do is we build a model and we have one set of priors, right? And we say, okay, well, these are subjective priors, that's cool. All models are subjective. And then I'm gonna, um, and especially strong is this in the scientific setting where I say, okay, um, we have a, um, I observe some data, right? And I claim that this effect is significant, right? That's like usually how um, science has always operated. And then we say, okay, well, let's say red meat causes cancer, right? Um, yes or no. 
And if we do this in the Bayesian framework, right, we have to set a prior on what we think a priori without having seen any data, does red meat cause cancer, yes or no, right? Um, so now what do we do? Well, we, we could have two ways of approaching this and both sort of make sense to some extent. So one would be to say, well, I personally, um, as the research in question, probably I already like think that it does, right? I wanna like protect the public maybe. And I'm like, okay, well, I think there's a connection here. And I am, so I'm gonna impose my subjective belief that it does cause cancer, right? And then I set a prior that has like a positive correlation um, between red meat consumption and cancer. Um, and then I'm gonna estimate it and I'm gonna find like, oh yes, there's a significant correlation there and I write a paper on it and everyone gets super worried. Um, some of that feels wrong, right? Um, so maybe the alternative is to say, okay, well, I, like another way to think about priors is to say, well, we're gonna regularize things. So in that case, I should place my price conservatively and say, okay, what is the, um, the, the I'm gonna assume that in the absence of data, there's not gonna be a correlation between the two. So I place it around zero, but I allow for some variance around that, like a normal prior center around zero with some small standard deviation because effect size in this space are very small. Uh, but then it's not my own subjective belief, right? Um, and there's actually an even bigger problem to this is because depending on how I set my standard deviation, that might really influence the results. So if we want to make these like very objective statements, right? Um, that is steeply problematic. And actually, that's something where I think that um, frequentist modeling has a benefit I never always expect to say this out loud, but um, because one benefit of frequency modeling is that at least it's so, somewhat standardized across, right? Like if you test this, like we all agree that like alpha equals 0 0.05. So um, the, even though it's like technically as subjective as Bayesian is, right? Because we just have priors in a different way. Nonetheless, we rarely do we really change the priors um, in, in frequency modeling. Um, so that's a benefit, but there's actually a good base now to, to do, and that is we can just test on a different priors, right? So rather than just having a single model, we just have multiple models. We say, okay, well, here's the model of someone who like totally believes that it does cause cancer. Here's someone who is strongly convinced that it doesn't. And here's something in between. Here's like maybe a skeptic, but who would be, con um, who would be persuaded by, um, compelling data, right? And then we do that and then we see, okay, what type of person would be, should be convinced by this, right? Like the diehard fan um, who eats day uh, five times a week, maybe he's German, um, he or she. Um, and then, um, and just doesn't want to believe it, right? Like no amount of data will probably convince that person or it had to be like so overwhelming and that's cool, right? You can never convince everyone, but you can say, okay, well, if that is your prior belief, then this is maybe what you think, should think now, given that this data is there. So we sort of hedge our bets and we have multiple of these. So that's what I was reminded of, Galen, um, Galen, whatever. Um, when you said that, and I think this is something that we should be starting to do much more in Bayesian modeling for causal inference, but in, for inference in general is to just like consider multiple alternatives, multiple alternatives of priors, multiple alternatives of interventions, and multiple alternatives of structural causal relationships between our models, right? Um, and you can push this even further and say, okay, well maybe uh, like one thing that introduces a lot of uncertainty and like variance into the model is also just like how I prepare my data, right? So it's totally reasonable to say, well, I wanna, um, I use this threshold for outlier, uh, for removing outliers. What happens to my inference when I choose a different threshold, right? You can just do that. You can just like test, okay, well, under these starting conditions of, set, of changing the data, this is the results. And then, um, um, yeah, and then continue with that. So I think that's totally cool and something that is maybe not done enough, but we should be doing more.
Um, then we have Olivares, super cool talk, thank you. I would like to know when a node is fixed with the do operator into a certain value, what happens with the parent nodes, the ones above the hierarchy? Are those sampled from the prior or, simple, or simply not used in the model anymore? Yes, that's a great question. Um, the answer is that if it only went to this one graph that you replaced with a constant uh, using the Drew operator, right? So you have A to B, and there's a relationship between them, and then you set B to be an intervened value, then A will just be, it will still be there, right? But the connection is severed, and you will sample from the prior. That's simple. But what if you have A connects to B, and you change B, and A connects to C, but that might be observed, right? Well, in that case, it will not be the prior. It will just be like what B is um, the most likely values of B, given that they have influence C, which you observed. So um, it only severs the connections to those, to the, to the connections incoming to that node where you replace the values in the do operator. All the other ones are still intact. So if there's other structure that allows you to infer A, then it will do so. So I hope that makes sense. Um, so then I guess another, yep, go ahead. Don't see any other questions uh, in this social Zoom. So seems like we have covered everything. Uh, but yeah, if you are watching this uh, video on a letter dot and date, uh, or if you have any question in future, so please feel free to ask on this course. So we are there to uh, answer all the queries uh, in future. And uh, also uh, remember one thing: uh, the Pi MC Con is a recurring event, and the uh, uh, CAP uh, is still open. So if you have any idea or any talk uh, or you want to uh, uh, share anything uh, on Bayesian community, feel free to uh, go over to the pymc.com and there's the link, uh, pymccon.com and submit your proposal. Right? And you could be the next uh, speaker. Uh, yeah. So, any questions? I am Actually, I mean, we might be doing a PyMCCon uh, live conference. That is something, I mean, it's not like completely planned, but there's a lot of people who would like to do so. Uh, mm -hmm. So yeah, Justin, if you're, if you're up, it'll be good to know um, that there's demand for this. Uh, I mean, these online events are fun, but it's much more fun to uh, hang out live. And uh, yeah, that, that would be a fun thing to do. Um, but currently it's a virtual one. Yeah, second. like this. Uh, but currently, uh, if you submit uh, a talk, it's going to be a virtual one. So here, uh, right through the Zoom. Uh, okay, so thank you everyone for your active participation. And uh, once again, thanks a lot, Thomas, for taking time to uh, record his talk and this uh, awesome uh, q and session. So I think uh, we are good to go. And yeah, yeah uh, we, we have some upcoming event. Uh, uh, you'll be seeing our next. Uh, couple of months and next uh, next month also we have some interesting event so stay connected with us uh, subscribe to our youtube channel also this is a q, uh, q &A session is also will be posted to uh, youtube and also uh, subscribe to our meta uh, meetup event so that you get the notification uh, once we uh, post the new upcoming event there so thanks everyone and uh, uh, yeah so again end the session bye bye see you on the next bye bye, bye everybody thanks for joining